convincing answers which are putting your client further and further down the possible success ladder. Uh, but you can, by understanding the uh, witness, and I'm going to come back to that in one of my later rules, you can get a very successful set of answers. And I did um, a, a, a specimen cross-examination once at the Canadian Bar Association, and we had a case which was supposed to be about um, a, a, a family dispute where um, a Canadian family uh, were disputing where a child should live, and they entered into some sort of agreement and the mother who said she would not take the child and written it down, she'd not take the child away from this particular place and go somewhere else. My first question was to the father, do you wish the best for your child? Now that was a really trick question. What could he answer to that? No, I don't. Of course not. He had to say, I do want the best for my child, which leads very quickly on to the idea that if the best for the child is to move to a different city, and that was to do with languages, then he shouldn't allow some private agreement he made with his wife to stand in his way. And that is really trying to illustrate the point. Think where you're trying to go and try and get there early. Actually, witnesses are more guarded after they've been in the witness box for some time. And I quite frequently will start a cross-examination with a question I'm very carefully thought about. It won't look that way, it will look as if it's just sort of come to me, but I will have thought through exactly how I want to phrase it, and I will actually ask the question as I'm rising to my feet. It may sound very discourteous, I will never start with a witness, I'll very rarely start with a witness saying, good morning, Mr. Smith, my name is Goldsmith, I'm the advocate for so-and-so. That puts them at their ease. I'm afraid there's a little bit of keeping them um, off guard. So you do want a little bit to surprise your witness. But cross-examination is a tremendous skill and very difficult to achieve. Rule four, written advocacy is also advocacy. A lot of people forget this, and in today's world, with more and more matters being dealt with by briefs and written motions and things of that sort, people think, just get it down on paper and that's fine. It's not. It's still being read by someone who has to understand what you're saying. They're not necessarily going to pay the same amount of time that you've put into writing it. So it's got to be clear when you write it. And those people who think that as we move more to skeleton arguments and written briefs, that the art of advocacy is dying are, in my view, quite wrong. Written advocacy is still advocacy. And you have to remember the attention span of people for that reason. There are judges, there are people who will very carefully read everything that you've written down, they will make their own notes, and they will carefully analyze, and they will go back over it. Of course that happens. But often, people, particularly busy judges, will go through your arguments, they'll get the main points, but they won't necessarily take in all the subtleties, the points you want them to understand, unless you make them very, very clear. Uh, and that takes me to rule five, which is signposting. That's one of the things that I do a great deal, which is to signpost what I'm going to say. Um, you say to a court, I've got three points to make. Good, they know what's going to happen. They'll write down the first point. They'll expect the second point and the third point. Uh, somebody once said, you always tell a judge something three times. You tell them what you're going to say, then you say it, then you tell them what you said. <laughs> and actually, if you listen to experienced advocates, that is often exactly what takes place. Not all. Some advocates, Jonathan Sumption, our most recent, uh, our most re recent member of the Supreme Court, he took the view that he would only tell a judge once. And they got to know this, and they knew that if they didn't understand it first time around, he would take it to the next level court and they would understand it. <laughs> That's not a technique that everybody can use. You have to have a great deal of courage, self-confidence. There are other words I can use, but I don't use them now that he's a member of our top court. He's an outstanding advocate, but knows it as well. 
My sixth rule is that despite the fact that you are there to win a case, that is absolutely no excuse to break the standards of ethical conduct which you as members of the bar here, that I as a member of the bar in the United Kingdom need to obey. Advocacy is not a reason to misrepresent the position. It's not a reason to disrespect uh, your opponent. And I'll come back, let alone the court, and I will come back uh, to that in one moment. And I just want to pause on this for a moment because uh, I think it's not often always appreciated that ethical standards, proper professional conduct, is not just a sort of private thing between lawyers. It's not just, it's not just you know, as if you were a member of some secret society and therefore we all act in the same way. It is absolutely critical that the courts, especially in uh, courts which are busy, can utterly rely upon your integrity. Absolutely fight the case very hard, but never misrepresent what the position is, the law or the facts. You can tell the courts, look, there's a problem in this case, and this is what the answer to it is. Say that as forcefully as you like, but don't try to hide it. And certainly in, in London, in, in England and Wales, it happens that certain advocates get a reputation for not being straight. You can't rely upon them. And in those circumstances, they are not respected by the court. Therefore, they may win a few cases to start off with, but eventually they start not winning the cases. They don't become senior advocates, they don't become judges, because it's been seen what they do. Very different in continental Europe. I have a friend who went to become a judge in one of the European courts. And he sat in one case with two of his colleagues from continental European countries. And uh, after the hearing had finished, they went back into their retiring room, and one of his colleagues said, you asked the advocate some questions. He said, well, yes, I did ask the advocate some questions. He said, you asked the advocate about the law. He said, well, yes, I did. I asked him what he thought about this thing. He said, you can't do that. My friend said, why not? He said, well, there are two reasons. The first is you're a judge, and you're paid to know the law. You shouldn't be asking about it. And secondly, the advocate's only going to lie to you. Now, that sounds a very harsh judgment, but the point is that in those courts, they don't depend upon the advocates to tell them what the law is. They do their own research. There are thousands of judges. They do the research. They don't depend upon the advocates at all. In our courts, and I'm sure it's the same in your courts, the judges expect that if they ask a question, they will get an honest, proper answer. If one doesn't know, one says so. One doesn't hide a case that you know about that's relevant to it. This is part of the high ethical standards that you must respect. And at the end of the day, your clients will thank you for that because they're more likely in the long run. Your clients are more likely in the long run to win the cases because the judges know when you speak, they can rely upon you. They can rely upon you to tell the situation in a straight and honest way. I said something about respect, and I just want to move on to that because that's another part of it, respecting your opponents and, above all, uh, respecting, uh, respecting the judge. Um, there are cases, and there are some advocates who, who get away with this, that's because they're sufficiently senior, constantly interrupting your opponent when he's speaking to the court. Okay, we all do it, and the more senior of us do it when we think something's going wrong. But actually, it's not a great uh, way, and certainly younger advocates shouldn't do it. Wait your turn. The judge will always give you an opportunity to speak. But respect your opponents, respect your seniors, and above all, respect the judge. Effie Smith got away with it. On the whole, don't insult the judge. It rarely wins you the case. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes if you've got a jury, it may be slightly different. There was an advocate in England who, when he appeared in court, he always got the judge angry. Yeah, the judge would always be angry. Will you stop that and don't do this? And I order you not to do this. And you'd think, watching it, this is a very, very bad technique. For him, it was actually a great technique. 
because the jury would say, why is the judge always stopping that poor barrister from speaking? His client is getting, isn't getting a fair hearing. Well, the truth is, his client couldn't get a fair hearing because there wasn't anything much to be said for him. But by getting the judge angry and getting the jury on his side, he was able to make some progress. Well, that's uh, the exception. Um, I want to uh, then move on to my next rule, which is uh, don't use courtroom tricks. Uh, Marshall Hall used to come into court with a box of tissues and handkerchiefs, with a great big throat spray, with people who brought in silver salvers with bottles of water on them. And he would make a great play of spraying his throat, and drinking the water, and mopping his brow, and uh, blowing his nose, and noise of it. This was all to distract the judge from what his opponent was saying. Uh, he had another good trick, which was also if he got a bad answer, he would try and turn it into a good answer, particularly with a jury who didn't quite understand. On one occasion, a witness gave an answer. And it was actually a devastatingly bad answer from his point of view. It was exactly what he didn't want. Yeah. And instead of sort of looking as if he was concerned about it, he repeated the answer. He said, ah, so you say it did happen on the 23rd. He said, yes, it happened on the 23rd. He turned to his solicitor and said, make a note of that for our final speech. It happened on the 23rd. When his final speech came, he didn't say anything about it happened on the 23rd. And of course, that was very damaging. But neither did his opponent. Because his opponent thought, my gosh, that's a very good point for him. I better not remind the jury. Rule 9, adapt to changing circumstances. I've seen people go into court with a written script, a prepared script. doesn't work. You can't keep on the track of that because things will happen, the evidence will change, or simply you'll be asked questions which take you out of order. You cannot afford not to be able to respond. And I'll come to when I come to my three most important rules, how you, how you deal with that. But you need to adapt to changing circumstances. Uh, and you cannot, be, uh, you cannot be inflexible. And I've seen people with cross-examinations who say, write everything down and say, if the answer is A, then go to question 4. And if the answer is no, go to question 17. It's a bit like an examination uh, paper. And it, it can work, but in my experience, it's extremely difficult to have worked it through. You need to be ready to adapt. And my, when I come to my most important rule, uh, you will see how I think one should respond to that. Tenth rule, use psychology or use your understanding of commerciality. You have to think about what's going on. If you're looking at a contract, and you're trying to interpret what a particular clause means. Think what the business people were trying to achieve. And that will often help you understand it and persuade the judge of what you think it means. How does this work in the business world? This provision which says payment should be made on the 14th, and the question is, does it matter if it's the 14th or the 15th or the 16th? Think about the contract. You're arguing it does. You may want to show the judge why it mattered to this individual to have it on the 14th because their bank was expecting payment and there was an overdraft and there'd be defaults. If you think it doesn't matter, you're trying to say it doesn't matter, then you want to say, well, there's interest to be paid, so does it matter if it's the 14th or the 15th or the 16th? Think about it commercially, but also think about the psychology. This is, again, extremely important if you're trying to understand, if you're trying to deal with, with cross-examination. Uh, I've always admired in England, particularly, the advocates in the criminal world, in the criminal field, and the criminals themselves, of course, but they practice in that field. It's not what happens, even on the television screen, it's not what happens in books, it's real life, and people act in real life as they do in real life. Think through what would have happened if this is what was taking place. You say that you saw this walking down the street. Well, what, what did you see next to you? Were there any cars? What did you see? Or people who remember things with enormous detail. We know that doesn't happen. So the psychology is very, very important. 
back to my rule about trying to get an early question. Uh, I, I did a case once. I'm sorry all these anecdotes about me, but that's the only courts I ever sit in. And I've done it long enough, so at least there are some. There are a few anecdotes. And the, the question was, why, why, uh, this was a, a very high profile case, which was to do with a strike, and uh, whether or not the employers were entitled to dismiss a particular individual. And they said that the he 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 thrown a brick through uh, a neighbor's window because there was a personal dispute, some vendetta between them. We believed, I was acting for the employer, it was actually because he was throwing it through the window of someone who was a strike breaker. And it was all to do with the strike, and that's why they'd taken disciplinary action against him. And the union was there, and they'd made a great big thing about this, and the television cameras were there. I asked, my first question was, just to say to the individual, did you chuck, okay, colloquial English word, did you chuck the brick through his window because he was a scab? Scab, it's a colloquial word, for strike breaker. He immediately said yes. He hadn't thought through it, it was the first question. But if I'd asked the question, uh, is it not the case, Mr. Smith, that you threw this brick through this gentleman's window because you believed he'd been breaking strikes contrary to the strike that you were trying? He'd have, if he'd understood the question at all, he would have said no, because he'd been told to say no. But the psychology was to understand what was in his mind and use language which he would understand. Let me come to uh, say one other thing before I get to my most important rules, and that is uh, I haven't really said anything about the time uh, that I spent as Attorney General. Um, the British Attorney General is a bit different from the Indian Attorney General and the advocates and the additional assistants because uh, it is a political role as well as a legal role. Uh, so I sat in the cabinet, I had to advise the government as indeed the Indian Attorney General does on important issues, but also advocate for them. And the point I want to make is that despite the fact that I was a member of the government, it still seemed to me always essential not to confuse advocacy with advice. And that, in a sense, is the rule. When you're advising your clients, you need to tell them what they need to know, even though it's not what they want to know. You have to give them unpopular and unwelcome advice, because that's what your job is. And that's what they deserve to hear. It may not be what you say in court. You may take a different line in court, but you should tell them always what the truth, in your opinion, is. And nowhere was that more pointed for me than when I had to advise on military conduct by the British government, hugely controversial issues, uh, when, to me, it remained critically important to tell the Prime Minister and the others what I genuinely thought the law was. There are occasions people know about where people didn't like the answer. There are occasions where people don't know about where actually I advised against military uh, action. Always don't confuse advocacy uh, and advice. I'm going to turn to my top three rules. We're moving on in any event. Rule number one, be clear. That is the most important thing in what you're communicating, be clear. Before I became a judge, I used often to say to myself, why does that silly man on the bench not understand what I'm saying? After I'd become a judge, I'd say to myself, why can't these advocates be clearer? <laughs> Both illustrate the point. You're actually often not as clear as you think you are. I'm sure that great people who understand communication have spoken about, I think it was Marshall McLuhan who explained the mediums in the message. And it's true. If I say the word table, you may be thinking of a wonderful Louis Cass table seating 16 people in your dining room at home with ornate chairs and a tablecloth. Or you may be thinking about a little rickety wooden thing that sits by a, a, a bedside. The word can mean different things. It's true of communicating the law. You have to recognize that although the word means something to you, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to the person you're speaking with. You have to, in order to be clear, you have to think very carefully about what you are, are trying to say. So, judges and advocates, 
you actually benefit from being a judge because you then learn the difficulty. Uh, but you do need to be clear, rule number is important, rule number one. Important rule number two, probably even more important, be prepared. Preparation is everything. It's not, as I've said, a prepared script. I said I'd come back to that point. It's not a written script. It's understanding the case so you're ready to deal with it. So you are prepared. If the judge says, what about section 43? You know what section 43 is, and you've spotted the problem. So you can come out, oh my lord, that's not a problem at all. Section 43 has been conclusively explained as meaning this. Or at least if you say the confidence, even if it hasn't been conclusively explained, the judge might agree with your analysis. So preparation is critical. You have to. An American lawyer once said, you have to spend eight hours preparation for every hour in court. I'm not sure whether that's necessarily the right rule, but you certainly need to spend more time, substantially more time, preparing than actually being in court. Preparation, preparation, preparation. And my final rule for me is structure your arguments. I've already said this. I've got three points. It's actually always very good to have three points. Much better to have three points than four points or two points. I don't know why there's something psychological about it. So actually, people like three. It's a great number. So if you've actually got four points, put two of them together and make it three. If you've got two points, split one of them out. You're lawyers. You can do this. Not a problem at all. You can divide things up and reanalyze it. Three points is very, very good. Okay. Maybe sometimes you have to have more than three points. But the critical point is to have structured it, to know what you're saying and where you're going. And that helps with the preparation, because if you know in advance you're going to be making three points, that's what's in your head. And if the judge says this, you know that's actually your third point, and you're going to come to it later, you can tell him that. Lord Mackay of Clash Fern, who was British Lord Chancellor, but before that, was the Scottish Advocate General, which was the Lord Advocate, rather, forgive me, I'm just him, which is the Scottish Attorney General. He was addressing the House of Lords on one occasion when the great judge, Lord Diplock, said, well, Lord Mackay, what about this? He said, your Lordship is asking me about that point. He said, yes, Lord Mackay, we want to hear about that point. He said, I'm, I told your Lordship I'm going to deal with that as my fourth point. Is your Lordship inviting me to deal with it now? Yes, Lord Mackay, we are. Well, the invitation is declined. <laughs> and he went back onto his structure. At least he knew uh, what his structure was. He was a great advocate as well, actually. He was a great, great Lord Chancellor. But structure your arguments, at least he knew where he was going.